Good morning, First Baptist Church. Welcome to worship this morning. Would you stand this morning? We're going to give God praise as we sing to him together. Let's sing our God. Yes, we do. Searching for it. 
shout it. Shout it. Go on and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses. The God is love. Man, you guys can be seated. took a breath, you breathed your life in me, and you have been so, so kind to me. College retreats coming up. It's going to be an awesome time. If you're a college student and you're interested in being part of that, we invite you to do that. Um, right after the service in the lobby area, there'll be a little kiosk over there where you can sign up um, if you're able to do that. So take time to do that. It's gonna, God's going to be doing some amazing things there. So really consider being a part of that. And now it's my opportunity to say good morning to you. Good morning. morning. That's pretty good. Should we do it one more time? You think? Good morning. Oh, that's better. I like that. That's good. Um, can you take a moment, just right where you are, turn around, find someone you, you may not have met before and shake their hand, look them, look them in the eye and say good morning. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to welcome you this morning to First Baptist Church. If you're a visitor today with us, please note the exits in the rear of the room, uh, just in case of a fire or if things get weird. Um, if you decide to stay, we'd love the opportunity to get to know you more personally. In order to do that, please fill out a Connect card. I don't have one with me, but it's in the front of the bench in front of you. Uh, put it in the offering plate as it comes by, or you could drop it in one of the drop boxes that you'll find in the lobby. And if you do that, one of our pastors will send you an email and provide you with some information about the church. Of all the places you could be on a Sunday morning, you're choosing to be here. And we don't take that lightly. Thank you for the honor of sharing your time with us. At this time, we will collect our financial gifts as an expression of surrender and thankfulness to God. Believing all we have comes from God and belongs to him, we give a portion of our resources back to him out of gratitude for what God has done for us. And we choose to give because it's a way we can invest in what we consider to be God's work, not only here among us in this church and in our community, but also around the world. We may make our checks out to FBC, but make no mistake, these are gifts to God for the advancement of his kingdom. Please give generously today as God enables you. Let's take a moment to talk to God about these gifts that we are about to give and receive. Dear Father, always near us, may your name be treasured and loved. May your rule be completed in us. May your will be done here on earth in just the way it is done in heaven. Give us today the things we need today. 
and forgive us our sins and impositions on you as we are forgiving all who in any way offend us. Please don't put us through trials, but deliver us from everything bad because you are the one in charge and you have all the power and the glory too is all yours forever, which is just the way we want it. And now please accept these gifts that we bring to you and multiply them to accomplish way more good than we could ever accomplish on our own. We ask this in the name of the Father who made us, the Son who saves us, and the Spirit who dwells within us. Amen. Stop working, way maker, 
That's such a great reminder. I love that. Um, our scripture reading this morning comes from Habakkuk 1, verses 2 through 4, and then we're going to skip over to chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. You can find this in the blue Bibles in front of you on page 929 and then 931. So again, Habakkuk 1, verses 2 through 4, and Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Habakkuk 1, verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Now Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This morning we are honored to have as our guest speaker Keith Tully. Before becoming a pastor, Keith was the president of marketing for North America with Gillette, where he managed two billion, that's billion with a B, of revenue. Is that true? That's a, man, okay. And since then, he has pastored three New England churches. Keith also served as the president of Vision New England, caring for pastors and consulting with churches all over our region. Our own Pastor Greg is very grateful for Keith's mentoring and friendship. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Keith Tully. Well, good morning. It's really great to be here. So I know <clears throat> that um, so Greg called me uh, probably, what's today, Sunday, right? So probably Friday. And he said, Keith, Keith, can you help me? So he's sick, right? I mean, he's really sick. And um, I was supposed to be here next Sunday, and he just asked if we could pull that up this week. So it is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to be here. Um, we have a history with this church going back a number of years, and we love your pastor and his family. So thank you for giving me the privilege and the opportunity to be here. So before we, we jump into our study, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, it might be helpful if I share a little bit about what's been going on in my life health-wise. About a year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, about a year ago, I was diagnosed with late-stage melanoma. And for those of you who don't know, late-stage melanoma, or melanoma itself, is a very deadly and dangerous form of skin cancer. My CAT scans had revealed that the cancer, which had started in a tumor in my left thigh, had now traveled into my lymph nodes, into my liver, into my lungs, and into my bones. Now, from what I understand, a few years ago, a diagnosis like this was pretty much a, a death sentence for anyone who received it, with only a very small percentage of people living uh, a year or so beyond their diagnosis of this. But wouldn't you know it, out of his mercy and his grace, God connected me with this awesome and amazing oncology team at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And they are relentlessly pursuing a better outcome for me. And I'm very, very thankful for that. I've had multiple surgeries. I've had a series of targeted radiation treatments. And I'm currently um, receiving very powerful immunotherapy intervention. 
All of this is aimed at slowing down and helping to destroy the killer that is seeking to ravage and destroy me. Along this journey, I've experienced the debilitating effects of having cancer spread across your body, as well as the difficulties of having cancer drag me into dark places, emotionally and spiritually. And if you've ever experienced something like this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've also experienced a, an array of painful side effects because of the high level of toxicity of the drugs that they're pumping into my body to try to attack this disease. Now, I, I share all this with you because it is inevitable for each of us that at some point in our lives, we're going to be confronted with a time of suffering and uncertainty, either for ourselves or for someone we know and love who is close to us. A time of suffering and uncertainty that I believe most likely some of you are experiencing even in this time. And for many of us, this time of difficulty, it's going to greatly test our relationship with God. I know it, it has for me repeatedly. Quite possibly, it's going to challenge the way that we, we talk to God. It's going to challenge our level of trust in God. And it's going to challenge our ability to find any, any joy in the midst of the difficulties that we find ourselves in. And so because of this reality, the question that I'd like for us to explore together this morning is this question, how should we approach our relationship with God when we find ourselves in the midst of suffering and uncertainty? And to help us with this, I'd like for us to look together at a conversation that God had with a guy named Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And the reason why I want to look at this particular conversation is because there are some very practical life principles that we find here. Life principles that can help you and I discern how are we to approach God when we are confronted with suffering and uncertainty in our lives. Now, for context, this conversation takes place most likely around the early 7th century BC. And Habakkuk is living somewhere in the southern Jewish kingdom of Judah. At this time, the people of Israel, well, they're still being ruled by their own kings, and they were enjoying relative peace and prosperity, living in the land that their forefathers had conquered. But instead of honoring God and obeying God for all that he had done for them, they were becoming corrupt. And they were also being negatively influenced by the nations that were around them. They'd even gone so far as embracing some of the religious practices of these nations and worshiping some of these nations' gods. They were no longer adhering to the law of Moses. And there were significant injustices being perpetrated upon those among them who couldn't fend for themselves. And it's against this backdrop of internal corruption and strife that Habakkuk, one of God's prophets, approaches God and he lodges a couple of complaints. The first of which is this. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice. Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. The law has become paralyzed and there's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. That's his first complaint. And basically what Habakkuk is asking God in this complaint is this. Why God do you, do you allow your people to continue in their wickedness? Violence has increased. Your law is not being followed. Injustice is rampant. Good people are being persecuted by wicked people. 
And I continue to cry out to you, God, but you don't answer. How long do I have to continue looking upon the wickedness of my own people without you acting to save us? This is basically Habakkuk's complaint to God. Well, Habakkuk doesn't have to wait long at all for an answer to his complaint, as God responds immediately. But the response Habakkuk gets is probably not what he was hoping for. For here's what God said. He said, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people, who sweep across the earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. They all come bent on violence. They gather prisoners like sand. They sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose strength is their own God. God tells Habakkuk that he doesn't have to wait much longer. The answer to his complaint is right there on the horizon. See, God's judgment against the wickedness of his people, it's about to be metered out. For he's going to raise up a violent and ruthless nation that is going to sweep down on the people of Israel, ravage their land, and take them into captivity. Well, after hearing this terrifying response from God, Habakkuk shares a second complaint as he says this, O Lord, are you not from everlasting my God, my Holy One? Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them to punish us for our many sins. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You see, Habakkuk acknowledges that because of God's holiness and his purity, he is certainly justified in bringing upon his people the consequences of their wickedness. But what Habakkuk is struggling with now is how a holy and just God can allow a nation that's even more wicked and more violent to completely destroy the people of Israel. A people who God himself has said, I love this people and I have chosen this people as my own. It doesn't seem right. It seems like God is in essence tolerating an even greater act of wickedness. While Habakkuk doesn't bring an outright charge of unrighteousness to God, he is transparently complaining to God that he's struggling with how God's actions fit with what Habakkuk knows about God's love and his purity. And it's within these two complaints that we glean our first life principle. And that life principle is this. In times of suffering and uncertainty, we can be totally transparent with God. We can tell God exactly how we're feeling. You see, Habakkuk had no reservations about telling God what was on his heart. He complained about God's lack of response in the midst of his own people's wickedness, and he complained about a perceived discrepancy that he saw between God's actions and God's holiness. He didn't bring a charge against God, as I had mentioned, as though God was on trial before him. What he brought were his frustrations and his concerns. You see, Habakkuk was totally totally transparent with God. You know, sometimes in our prayers, if we're not careful, you and I can approach God as though we need to protect him from how we're really feeling. For some reason, we may have gotten the idea that we actually need to sugarcoat what we have to say to God because he may not be able to handle what's really going on inside of us. Or we may withhold how we really feel because we don't want to tick him off. 
We don't want to rattle his cage and get him upset with us because then we might not get what we're asking for. Yet the, yet the God who knows our thoughts before we think them and knows our needs before we even ask of them, he wants us to speak to him with an open and an honest heart. In times of turmoil and uncertainty, God wants him, us to tell him what we are really thinking and what we are really feeling. You see, God is not fragile and weak, as though we need to shield him from us. Nor is he capricious or volatile, requiring that we walk around on eggshells before him. He's not. He loves us. He wants to hear from us. And he wants us to be honest before him. You see, when we are faced with hardship and confusion, it is okay for us to complain to God as long as we do so with respect. It is okay for us to share our concerns with him as long as we do so out of a sense of humility before him. It is okay for us to tell God what's on our heart as long as we are continuously mindful of who it is we are talking to. God is the God of truth, and he wants you and me to deal with him truthfully. It's okay for us to be totally transparent with God and tell him how we feel, especially in times of suffering and uncertainty. Well, after a brief period of waiting, God responds. He responds to Habakkuk's second complaint. And what God tells him is that even though the Babylonians are coming to take the people of Israel captive, their enslavement is not going to last forever. There will come a time when God brings consequences upon the Babylonians for their wickedness and their unbelief, and they too are going to suffer under his judgment. But until that time comes in the midst of hardship and affliction, God reminds his prophet that God's people, the righteous, are to live by faith. What God is saying with this statement is that in the midst of impending terror and devastation and uncertainty, Habakkuk and the people of Israel are to trust their God. They are to trust God as his judgment is being metered out. They are to trust God with the outcome no matter how painful the journey is, to get there. God's people are to trust God. Well, in response to what God has shared, Habakkuk says this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O oh Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. See, the prophet has resigned himself to what God's about to do. And he has accepted that God's actions are both warranted and needed. But his one request is that in the midst of bringing hardship upon his people, that God will, be, will remember to be merciful to them. Habakkuk is not asking God to be kind because any of the people deserve it, because they don't. He's just asking God to show mercy out of the goodness of his grace. And as the reality of all that God has just told him begins to settle in, Habakkuk transparently shares with God out of the depths of his heart two final statements. The first of these is this. He says, I heard and my heart pounded my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones. My legs trembled, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. See, Habakkuk knows that what is about to take place is really going to be difficult. For the nation God is bringing upon them <clears throat> is exceedingly violent and ungodly. 
And so he opens up his heart and he transparently shares the depths of his fears about what lies ahead for him and his people, as well as sharing his trust in God and his firm resolve to wait patiently for the outcome. And it's in God's earlier response to Habakkuk and the prophet's initial response to God that we glean our second life principle from this conversation. And that life principle is this. In times of suffering and uncertainty, we can fully trust God. Habakkuk's world was about to change dramatically as God was raising up the Babylonians to attack and take into captivity the people of Israel. But in the midst of all the hardship and uncertainty that was about to befall him, God called upon Habakkuk to trust him and to trust in him alone. You know, I remember sitting in uh, one of the cancer treatment rooms at Mass General with my family, listening to my oncology team walk us through the results of my latest scans. And what they had told us <clears throat> was that in a little over two months, my cancer had gone from a single tumor in my liver to now over 20 tumors in multiple organs and bones in my body. And they were now concerned about their ability to stop this. And so because of the rapid advance of my disease, the team made a decision to pull me out of a clinical trial that I was in and to shift me into a much more aggressive treatment pathway immediately. A treatment pathway that included injecting two very powerful drugs into my body to try and slow down the spread of this killer. And what they told us that was really sobering to hear, if that wasn't sobering enough, was that while there was no guarantee that these drugs were even going to work on my type of cancer, there was a very high level of certainty that I was going to experience significant side effects because of the high level of toxicity of the drugs they were about to pump into my body. Significant side effects that could either be temporary or permanent for me. So shortly after I gave my, my consent, <clears throat> they brought in a pouch of each of these drugs. They put a blood draw needle in one of my arms and an infusion needle in the other, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they started releasing the drug into my body. And as I watched the first dr drips of this, this drug go down the line and make its way into my body, I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, what is about to happen to me? What are they putting into my body? What if it doesn't work? And what if I experience the excruciating side effects that they're talking about? And when you know it, Right about the same time, I was beginning to feel just totally overwhelmed with these thoughts. I truly believe I heard the Lord say to me, as these drugs were pumped into my body, I really believe I heard him say this, Keith, will you trust me? Will you trust me in this? You see, no matter what is taking place around us, no matter how difficult our situation may, get, may become, God invites us to trust him. To trust that he really does love us. To trust that he really does hear us when we cry out to him. And because of who he is and what he's able to do, God invites us to trust that he is going to see us through the hardship and that affliction. That he's going to see us through the times of darkness and uncertainty. 
And then he's going to see us through those emotional and spiritual valleys that we will go through. When things are at their most difficult for us, God invites you and me to trust him. To trust him throughout the journey and to trust him with the outcome. Now, after declaring that by faith he will wait patiently for God to act, Habakkuk makes this final statement, which we read earlier. He says this, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. You see, Habakkuk proclaims that even though the upcoming assault of the Babylonians will most likely ravage their land and bring devastation to their likely livelihoods, he will still find joy. Even though famine and destruction appear on the land, he says, I will still rejoice. And the reason why Habakkuk can say this is because the object of his joy is not in his circumstance. It's in his God. In a time of impending catastrophe and great loss, Habakkuk declares his resolve to rejoice in his God and to be joyful in God his Savior. And herein lies our third life principle. As hard as as it is to believe, especially in times of great suffering, you and I can still find joy. But our joy must be anchored in our God. You know, when we are experiencing suffering and uncertainty, it is really hard to not become fully consumed with what is happening to us in the moment, especially when that moment is at 2 a.m. and you feel like you're all by yourself. And very difficult for us to find much joy in any of it. Something that's been very true for me, a number of different points in this journey I find myself in. But Habakkuk would suggest to us as counterintuitive as it sounds, that in the midst of present-day hardship, we can still find joy. We can still find joy. And the way that this joy comes to us is by asking God to fill our hearts and our minds with the anchoring truths of who He is, of what He has done for us through His Son, Jesus, and what he has eternally promised to us as Jesus' followers. For it is only when we focus on our eternal God and our, his eternal promises for us that we can find true joy to help us walk through the present realities of our time of suffering and uncertainty. So to summarize, in times of suffering and uncertainty, we can be totally transparent with our God. We can tell him everything that's going on inside of us. We can fully trust in our God because he is fully trustworthy. And we can find joy, but our joy must be anchored in him. These are but three of the critical life principles that we can glean from this conversation that God had with his prophet Habakkuk. And it is these three life principles that I believe raise some very important questions for us that I'd like to leave you with as we close this part of our study. Questions that have become very, very real for me and have tested me very greatly over the past year. The first of these questions is this. How is our level of transparency with God this morning? 
in times of suffering and uncertainty, God wants us to lay ourselves out bare before him. He desires that we be totally transparent with him and totally honest. So he asks us, how is our level of transparency with God? The second question that this conversation raises for us is this. How is our level of trust in God this morning? It is in the midst of times of suffering and uncertainty that God asks us, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust that I know what you need and that I will help you through this? Will you trust me along this journey and trust me with the outcome, even if you can't see it right now? How is our level of trust in our God? And then finally, a third question that this conversation raises for us is this. How is our level of joy? How is our level of joy? this morning, in God. Now, I have to say to you that in this past year, my transparency with God has increased dramatically as I find myself telling him everything. I don't hold anything back anymore. My trust in God has been both deeply challenged and deeply strengthened as I have seen very clear and powerful evidence that he is with me and he is for me as I go through this journey with him. And I am experiencing more and more of what it means to find joy in Jesus in the midst of this suffering and uncertainty that I find myself. I am incredibly grateful to stand before you this morning as a living testimony of God's power, his compassion, and his mercy. For a number of my tumors have been shrinking, and there has been no evidence of any new tumors in my body for the past three scans. And while there are no guarantees for how this is all going to turn out for me, I am so thankful for God's compassionate willingness to do what only he can do in a way that only he can do it. And to allow me the privilege of being with you this morning. In March of last year, we didn't know if I was going to get Christmas. And here I am. My prayer for each of us is that we will be a people of deepening transparency with God, deepening trust in God, and deepening joy, especially when we face suffering and uncertainty in our lives. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Let's pray. My sovereign Lord, you truly are a good, good father. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your son. And we thank you for your spirit. Lord, I pray that for each of us this morning, especially if there is anyone here this morning who finds themselves in a place of suffering and uncertainty, would you reach down? Would you comfort us and strengthen us and reassure us 
but you are for us. And may we be a people of deepening transparency with you, unashamed and unafraid to tell you all about us and what we're feeling. May we be a people of deepening trust. And may you help us find joy in the midst of our difficulty. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. Just stand and let's sing praise to our God as we close. I'm set, you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we make I'm set. Our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us We seek your King See
So let's go out with the Lord's benediction and please remember to pray for Greg. God will give him the healing quickly. Oh God, to you who are able to keep us from falling and to present us before your glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To you, the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. God bless.